tonight. Relentless protests. Doctors continue to call for justice in India as police forces attempt to quell violence at the rallies. Separatist violence. Pakistan mourns for those lost to the hands of militant forces with over 70 counted dead so far. Remembering the fallen. Trump pays his respects to soldiers lost in the Kabul airport attack while drawing attention to the failings of the Biden-Harris government. Carnival crazy. It's time for some fun over at Notting Hill as the UK celebrates its diversity with rainbows of colour. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Other Than a World News Tonight. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight on World News. We have lots of key stories to get you up to date on this Tuesday night, from political unrest to natural disasters. But first, we begin in neighbouring India. Police in India fired tear gas and water cannon to disperse hundreds of protesters marching in the eastern city of Kolkata to demand the resignation of a top state minister in the wake of a gruesome rape and murder of a trainee doctor. Protesters led by university students broke through iron barricades set up on the route of their march to West Bengal State Secretariat, resulting in a baton charge by the police, who had earlier declared the protest illegal. The attack on the 31-year-old doctor has caused nationwide outrage, similar to the widespread protests witnessed after a 2012 gang rape of a 23-year-old student on a moving bus in New Delhi, with campaigners saying women continue to suffer from high levels of sexual violence despite Despite tougher laws. A police volunteer has been arrested for the crime and the federal police have taken over the investigation. Junior doctors have refused to see non-emergency patients in many parts of the country since the incident at Kolkata state-run R.G. Carr Medical College as they launched protests demanding justice for the victims and greater safety for women at hospitals. India's Supreme Court has created a hospital safety task force and has requested protesting doctors return to work, but some have refused to budge including in West Bengal, of which Kolkata is the capital. Pakistan held funeral prayers for security forces killed in Balochistan province when separatist militants attacked police stations, railway lines and highways. Pakistan's military said 14 soldiers and police and 21 militants were killed in fighting after the largest of the attacks with at least 73 people killed in total. The assaults were the most widespread in years by ethnic militants who are fighting for Balochistan to secede from the rest of the country. The southwestern province is rich in resources and also hosts significant projects led by China. Pakistan's military said 14 soldiers and police and 21 militants were killed in fighting after the largest of the attacks, which targeted buses and trucks on a major highway. Balochistan's chief minister said nearly 40 civilians were also killed. The Baluch Liberation Army, armed militant group, took responsibility for the operation. In a statement to journalists, they claimed more attacks over the last day that had not yet been confirmed by authorities as of early Monday. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif vowed that security forces would retaliate and bring those responsible to justice. The weather continues to cause chaos over in Thailand tonight as heavy floods that led to lethal landslides are now displacing thousands more, with authorities struggling to keep their heads above water with the influx of victims from the severe weather. And for updates, we have other than a world news special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa in Phuket, Thailand. Hello. We have a report from Thailand today. Persistent monsoon rains have brought floods and mudslides all over Thailand, especially in the northern provinces, which is mostly affected area, where we hear news like over 20 people are dead and few dozens are missing. And the impact is range into several thousand, tens of thousands of households. Prime Minister Shinawatra is leading a relief effort in the northern province. Uh, she's coordinating the flood reliefs uh, in her hometown. Uh, where the, uh, the news we saw today says like uh, there were some bridges fallen and there are even some missing people. 
So these persistent monsoon rains have impacted uh, mostly northern province, but also Bangkok and the southern area, which I am based in Phuket, where we have like rains for the past few days. Even in the Bangkok, uh, we see news about uh, floods and rescue efforts. So the whole Thailand is expected to suffer from heavy rains even in the next few days. And the rains may cease, but there's another concern of a big massive typhoon hitting Japan in next two, three days. Over to you. Thank you. That was Adhaderna World News Special Correspondent Rasita Chandradasa in Phuket, Thailand. Japan has accused a Chinese spy plane of breaching its airspace in what would be the first known instance of such a direct violation. Japan's scrambled fighter jets after a Y-9 surveillance plane violated the territorial airspace of Danjo Islands for about two minutes. Japan's chief cabinet secretary called the breach utterly unacceptable and summoned a Chinese embassy official in Tokyo to protest. The incident comes as tensions rise in the region where China competes for influence against the U.S. and its allies, including Japan. Japanese authorities issued notifications and warnings to the Chinese aircraft during the incursion, but no weapons such as flag guns were used. Nonetheless, the incident has stoked concern. The Japanese government said it had contacted Beijing through diplomatic channels to lodge a strong protest over the incursion and demand the prevention of such breaches in the future. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Lin Jian said they had no intention of invading the airspace of any country and that relevant departments were still trying to understand the situation. Australia will introduce a cap on the number of new international students it accepts as it tries to reduce overall migration to pre-pandemic levels. The nation has one of the biggest international student markets in the world, but the number of new enrollments will be limited to 270,000 for 2025. Each higher education institution will be given an individual restriction, the government announced, with the biggest cuts to be borne by vocational education and training providers. The change has angered the tertiary education industry, with some universities calling it economic vandalism, but Canberra says it will improve the quality and longevity of the sector. Australia is a host to about 771,500 international students, according to the latest government figures from early 2024. Education Minister Jason Claire acknowledged that higher education was hard hit during the pandemic when Australia sent foreign students home and introduced strict border controls. He also noted, however, that the number of international students at universities is now 10% higher than before COVID-19, while the number of private vocational and training providers is up 50%. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un watched as new suicide drones took off and destroyed test targets, including a mock tank, and urged researchers to develop artificial intelligence for the unmanned vehicles. That's according to state media on Monday, which released these images said to show Kim inspecting the drones on Saturday at North Korea's Drone Institute and looking on as they took off and destroyed test targets, including a mock tank. Also known as loitering munitions, they attack by crashing into the target with a built-in warhead. Such weapons have been widely used in the war in Ukraine as well as in the Middle East. The report said Kim urged researchers to develop artificial intelligence for the unmanned vehicles and called to ramp up production of suicide drones, including those that can be used underwater, as well as reconnaissance and multi-purpose attack drones. <laughs> South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff said on Monday they were monitoring North Korea's military activities and were prepared for any provocations. When asked about visual similarities between some of the drones in the images from Kim's Saturday visit and those used and produced by Russia, a spokesperson said more analysis was necessary. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight. 
Former President Donald Trump participated in a wreath-laying ceremony at the Arlington National Cemetery to mark the third anniversary of the Kabul airport attack that killed 13 U.S. service members while putting a focus on the Afghanistan withdrawal and slamming the Biden-Harris government for its failures. At the tomb of the unknown soldier at Arlington National Cemetery today, Donald Trump laid a wreath in honor of three Marines who were among the 13 service members killed three years ago today during the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And later, speaking at the National Guard Association's convention in Detroit, Trump made that botched operation and the Taliban's swift takeover a centerpiece of his argument against Vice President Kamala Harris. Caused by Kamala Harris, Joe Biden, the humiliation in Afghanistan set off the collapse of American credibility and respect all around the world. Trump declared that if he's reelected, there will be accountability. We'll get the resignations of every single senior official who touched the Afghanistan calamity to be on my desk at noon on Inauguration Day. You know, you have to fire people. You have to fire people when they do a bad job. We never fire anybody. At the Democratic National Convention, Harris made it clear she is ready to fend off attacks on her toughness on national security. As commander in chief, I will ensure America always has the strongest, most lethal fighting force in the world. Harris has been off the campaign trail since the convention wrapped up, but Trump has been revving up the pace of his campaign. Later this week, he'll travel to Wisconsin before returning here to Michigan on Thursday, telling some of his campaign's volunteers here late today that this critical battleground state could decide the entire election. If we can win this state, we win the whole thing. We win the whole thing. Now we're going to win the whole thing. U.S. Special Counsel Jack Smith asked Federal Appeal Court to revive the criminal case accusing Donald Trump of retaining classified documents after a lower court dismissed the indictment in July. Smith's Monday court filing argued that Eileen Cannon was wrong in ruling that U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland's decision to appoint Smith in 2022 violated the U.S. Constitution. Smith and his team urged the appellate court to reverse her order and to schedule oral arguments writing that Cannon had, quote, deviated from binding Supreme Court precedent and also misconstrued the statutes that authorize the special counsel's appointment. In the case, Trump was indicted on charges that he willfully retained sensitive national security documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida after leaving office in 2021 and obstructed government efforts to retrieve the material. Trump's lawyers had previously challenged the legal authority for Smith's appointment arguing that Smith's office was not created by Congress and the special counsel was not confirmed by the Senate. Cannon's decision to dismiss the case came not long after the Supreme Court ruled that Trump had broad criminal immunity from prosecution for official actions he took during his time in office. Her ruling marked a legal victory for Trump, but has also faced staunch criticism, with many attorneys saying it flies in the face of prior court decisions which all upheld the legality of rules the Justice Department has relied on for years to appoint special counsels. Trump's campaign said on Monday that the court should reject Smith's request and that other cases the former president faces should be dismissed. French President Emmanuel Macron has hosted a string of French party leaders at the presidential Elysee Palace in hopes of finding a candidate for prime minister that would not immediately be toppled in a no-confidence vote in parliament. That is exactly what the far-rights Marine Le Pen and Jordan Bardella said they planned on doing if the candidate and the government came from the left-wing New Popular Front. So we've asked for an extraordinary session to be opened so that the Prime Minister, whoever it is, can appear before the National Assembly. The New Popular Front and its programme, movement and figures that personify it today represents a danger. We will defend the country from a government that will divide French society. The National Assembly is largely split between three blocs, with none close to a majority. But as the largest of the three, the left-wing New Popular Front argues that it should form the government. It has asked Macron to consider 37-year-old economist and civil servant Lucie Castet as head of government. 
Over the weekend, as a compromise, hard-left France unbowed leader Jean-Luc Mélenchon said that the government would not have to include his party members, a key objection of the right and centre. The pressure is mounting on Macron, who is now left to caretake a government in place for an unprecedented period, and with the deadline to present a draft 2025 budget just over a month away. A huge Russian missile and drone salvo launched at Ukraine targeted energy facilities nationwide and left several people dead, while neighboring NATO member Poland reported a, a drone had probably entered its airspace. Thousands of residents took shelter underground as sirens blared through Kyiv overnight. In the southern Zaporizhia region, this woman says she heard a loud explosion and sought safety. Later, she found out her brother was killed in the blast. She says she couldn't get too close because his house was blocked off. I was still shaking, and then I saw him, and I couldn't recognize him, she says. Ukrainian officials say Russia launched more than 200 missiles and drones in the attack. And neighboring NATO member Poland reported a drone had probably entered its airspace during the bombardment. Kyiv said the attack targeted power or other critical infrastructure in at least 10 regions. This is the aftermath of a strike on one power plant. Power cuts and water supply outages were reported in many areas, including parts of the capital. President Volodymyr Zelensky said work was already underway to get power flowing again. Monday's attack was the most intense in weeks. It comes as Ukraine is claiming new ground in a major cross-border incursion into Russia's southern Kursk region. Meanwhile, Russian forces are steadily inching forward in Ukraine's east. Both Russia and Ukraine deny deliberately targeting civilians. Each says its attacks are aimed at destroying infrastructure critical to the other's war effort. Italian prosecutors have launched an investigation into the captain of the super yacht that sank off the coast of Sicily during a storm last week, resulting in the deaths of British tech magnate Mike Lynch and six others. On Monday, a judicial source confirmed Italian media reports that 51-year-old New Zealand national James Cutfield is being investigated for manslaughter and shipwreck. Being placed under investigation in Italy does not imply guilt and does not mean formal charges will necessarily follow. The decision was made after Cutfield was interrogated for a second time. Reuters has been unable to contact him. The British flag Basian super yacht was carrying 22 people when it capsized and sank within minutes of being hit by a fierce storm. It killed Lynch, his 18-year-old daughter and five other people. Fifteen people survived, including Lynch's wife. Cutfield and his eight surviving crew members have made no public comment yet on the disaster. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. Revelers at London's Notting Hill Carnival, one of the world's largest street parties, touted the multicultural event's ability to foster unity and diversity. This year's carnival is taking place about a month after racist riots in late July that were sparked by false information online about the suspected killer of three young girls in a knife attack in Southport, northwest England. The 56th edition of the carnival was expected to draw a million people to the streets of West London to celebrate the city's diversity and its Caribbean community. The carnival traces its roots to the hundreds of thousands of migrants from the Caribbean, known as the Windrush Generation, who came to Britain between 1948 and 1971 to help rebuild the country following World War II. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. Stay tuned as Sanavi Mudanaika will join you next with the Nightly Distance Report. Thank you for watching. Good night.